legal part. We won't give it to you. Good morning, folks. Want to talk more about about uh, Lab Three today? We we talked a little bit about dynamics. We talked quite a lot about dynamics last time. The dynamics for the ball interaction. We need to talk a little bit about the fixed point implementation of the dynamics because you don't have time to do floating point. Uh, we also need to talk about the analog to digital converter and control functions and direct memory access to produce sound. However, before that, I'd like to talk a little bit more about Lab 2. As I said last week, and I put it on, 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 on Piazza, the, there's a set of self-consistent examples for Labs 1, 2, and 3 which are on the development board page. If you download the zip file and then substitute in any of the source codes, it'll compile and run on the big board. The older examples do not because it uses subtly different pins for different functions. So, once again, you should be using these examples to test your board, to do it, test the DAC, animation example, or the keypad. <coughs> With regard to timing, remember that there is a PT underscore get time macro that returns the system time in milliseconds with a timeout period of uh, two and a half months or so. So PT get time will give you a unique millisecond reading from reset forward for doing say cricket calls. If you want to get more accurate than that, you can read the timer that runs PT get time, which is timer 5. Do not use timer 2 for getting times, because timer 2 resets rather often. If you're, if you're synthesizing at 100 kilohertz, timer 2 resets every 400 cycles, every 10 microseconds so that you can never use that timer for timing millisecond intervals. What other questions are there about lab 2 at this point? Is there a PT function that can equal less than one microsecond? One microsecond? I mean one millisecond. There is no PT yield command that can yield for less than a millisecond, but why do you need that for this lab? But I believe the specification is plus or minus one millisecond, right? However, yes, you can. You could, you could yield until until read T5 plus constant or read T5 is greater than old T5 plus constant. So you could record the value of T5 in a variable, old T5. You could add a constant to it, and then you could yield and tell the current read of T5 is greater than this. That will give you accuracy down to machine accuracy. Actually, it will give you accuracy down to the scheduler interval, which may or may not be better than one millisecond. Well, it's probably better than one millisecond. Scheduler interval is probably better than one millisecond unless you have a really heavy thread, and then it'll stall. What else? I was just yield and tell um, done by hardware. No, yield and tell is done by software, but T5 is hardware timer. So this is this will be sitting in some 
internal polling loop, it'll be checking the internal state of that every time you schedule the thread. The more often you schedule the thread, the more accurate it will be. I'm not asking you to do this, however. You don't have to do this. Timing to the millisecond using PT get time is good enough. What else? Everybody, state machine running fine. You got you can get keys reliably. So there's two major parts: the synthesizer and the and the key decoder parameter state machine. Everybody got both of them going? How many's got the state machine going? Key decoder. Good. How many got, got the synthesizer going? How many got both? Oh dear. <laughs> time's, time's short. I'll, I'll open up lab tomorrow morning. We cannot be open this afternoon or this evening because of 2300. I know. They're in the way. Monday, they have the lab from 1.30 to 10.30. 10.30 in the evening. 10.30 in the evening, yes. And then Tuesday, they have it from 1.30 to 4.30. So I can open up tomorrow at 8 a.m. if you want, maybe a little before. I'm often here by 7.30. Students typically aren't. But, but... <laughs> Will you be in the, in the in office? I'll be in my office by 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. So, I'd be happy to open up tomorrow morning and, and, and chat about the status of stuff. Wednesday we can be open most of the day except for lecture. Ooh, well, we'll be open all day Wednesday. Thursday probably most of the day. And Friday will be a wasteland of open seats and steaming remains. Questions about lab two? Obscurities. I've seen some obscure stuff. The one that's most obscure is the state keeps changing and I don't do anything. On my state machine. That always means, nine times out of ten it means, that you didn't make the variable a static variable. And that therefore, since if it's a local, if it's an automatic local variable, a C automatic local, it's on the stack. And if you exit the function, which you do every time you do a context switch, then the, that machine, that the stack is purged and you'll be reading back a random number from the stack that exists when you recall the function. Declare every local variable static if you expect it to be persistent. Um, <coughs> are we expected to handle weird edge cases on the keypad? Like for example... How weird? <coughs> for example, um, using um, fairly normal state machine code with uh, the sort that you gave us, um, if you start pressing down the uh, the button for number four, and then you, uh, it, while holding down four, start pressing down number one, it will register that you released four and start pressing down. So that's actually correct. Right, so th I mean that's called rollover. And now, will it, what will happen to the state machine? Um, your state machine should roll to release and then go back through again. Which is correct. Right, but because you scan each row, if you are holding down one and you start pressing four, it will continue to think that you're pressing one and not realize you're pressing four. Oh, that yes, that's broken as designed. I'm the the I'm okay with that for this lab. Yeah, no, if if you press one, the way my decoder works, it'll never notice that you pressed four because it bails out of the loop before it tests four. Exactly. That's all right. I mean, those. I'm not going to ask you to handle weird edge cases. I'm not going to ha ask you to handle diagonal button pushes, which my code doesn't do correctly, uh, or various other combinations. 
Assume that the person is going to moderately accurately press single buttons, but occasionally hit two buttons, in which case you ignore the result. Um, we have this weird bug where if the user inputs something that's not possible, uh, the generator will try to do something, which is obviously wrong, but afterwards if you change the input to something that is possible, it sort of it still does something incorrect. It like breaks it if you try something impossible for one time. Well, that sounds like uh, you're not initializing something that you think that should be initialized, but I don't know what it is. So if you if you and you, so if you break it, it never fixes itself. That sounds like an initialization problem. But but you could also be branching off into the ozone on some on some uh, ill-defined state machine and get caught someplace. That's unlikely, though, if you if it still operates after afterwards. So I don't know. I'll look. I'll be happy to look at it. But that one I can't guess. On your website, some of the example cricket calls are outside of the range. That you they are. Yeah. No. Call two. Has a chirp of 1500, but it only goes up the range says a thousand. Look at that! <coughs> You're quite right. Somebody ought to edit these things. Uh, <laughs> I think you meant 500, didn't you? That's what I figured, because they're just going up. <laughs> yeah, that's what I meant. <laughs> no, I don't know. Uh, that's call this correct, that incorrect. Is that Zero to a thousand. So is the lower line always more correct than the upper line? <laughs> Let's call the range correct. Okay. <coughs> okay. Anything else on lab two? All right, going back over to lab three, then we talked about implementing the dynamics of the, of the ball interactions as kind of a vector system last time. And, but I want to talk a little bit about efficient arithmetic because part of this lab is efficiency. I want you to solve the system fast because you're going to be graded partly on the number of balls that you can that you can animate. Given that floating point is simulated on this on this CPU, there, which is to say there's no floating point hardware, it's calculated in software, there's an opportunity for making faster soft <coughs> faster arithmetic systems using fixed point arithmetic. And in, in fixed point, we're just going to take this 32-bit this word, we're going to break it into two pieces and put the binary point after bit 15. So 0 through 15 is now a fraction, a binary fraction. And Mostly, this is just in the way you're looking at the number rather than anything the CPU does, but there are a couple of special cases we have to think more carefully about. So if I, if I were to move the binary point, oh yes, and the top bit is obviously two's complement sign. So this is a two com two's complement number. So we have a range of plus minus 32,000 and a fractional size of 2 to the minus 16th, which is right around 1.5 times 10 to the minus 5. Yeah? By fractional size, you mean like the denominator? What I mean is, the, so you, in, if you have an integer, if you have an integer, then the binary weight of this digit is 1 and the binary rate of, the, rate of that digit is 2 and this is 4 and so on, right? 
the binary weight of this digit is one half. So when there's a one in this location the v and zero is every place else, the value that you assign to this number is one half rather than a larger number. So, so the binary weight of this is two to the minus sixteen, the last digit down here. So, given that we have a two's complement hardware adder on this, on this CPU, does add work for this? <coughs> oh, this would be a clicker question if you only had clickers. How about you, you simulate it by clicking? <laughs> yeah, is, 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 so does it work or does it not work? Does it add or work? Does a two's complement add or work for, for, for fixed point numbers? Yes. yes. It's all in your head where the binary point is. Subtraction works. Multiply we have to be a little bit careful about. So if we take two 16, uh, I'm going to call this 16 colon 16 fixed point. If we take two 16 colon 16 bit fixed point numbers and multiply them, then we get a 64 bit number out. And where is the binary point? Where? In the, the bit number? 31. Okay. So. So the binary point of the result is at position 31 of a 64-bit result. And actually between 31 and 32, between a, of a 60-bit result. And the piece of it that matters is the center 32 bits. Because we want the output of the multiplier to be back in 1616 format. Therefore, we're going to need to truncate the underflow and ignore it. And we better have nothing up here or it's an overflow. So while add always works, multiply will not necessarily work if the number is too big. 181 squared will overflow a 32,768 integer. That as Don't do it. In other words, you're going to have to you're going to have to error error bound check. You're going to have to bounds check if you think there's a possibility of a multiply going over bounds. Now, one way to avoid that is always multiply by a number less than one. I mean, that sounds obvious, but that's what's done in DSP quite a lot. So. Then, if we codify, if we, if we turn that, that statement into code for 1616 <coughs> fixed point, we'll find that we want to write a macro. And we're going to use macros here because using a, a function is too slow. We're going to have mult fix 16 of A times B is going to extend the two parameters A and B to long longs, 64 bits. Then it's going to multiply them. Then it's going to shift them 16 bits to the right and convert it back to type 615, uh, fix 615, fix 16, fix 16, which is actually a, just an int, signed int. So, if you then take two numbers that are in 1616 format, plug them through multifix, what will come out will be a 1616 formatted product. We also need functions. We need int to fix, 
16, we need fix to int 16. We need float to fi fix 16. And I've thoughtfully provided those for you. So float to fi oh, so how do you how do you convert an int? Let's say we have the number one in binary format. So that's that number is one and the rest are zeros. The first bit is a zero. How do we convert that to fixed format? How do we commit can we con convert that to a fixed format unity value? We shift it 16 bits to the left. Because a 1 in 16 16 format has the in 16 16 the first digit is 1 after to the left of the bi of the binary point. So we take the 1 here, we shift it 16 bits over, now we have a 1. So int to fix is take the input A and shift it 16 bits. Going fixed to int is just the opposite. This actually truncates. Fixed to int 16 takes the value in A which is now a fix, shifts it right 16 and converts it to an integer and just throws away all the binary all of the fractional bits. These two are fast, int to fix and fix to int are fast because there's just a single shift and it's a fixed point operation. Float to fix, float to fix requires that you do a floating point divide by 65, 536, which happens to be equivalent to a 16-bit shift of a floating point number. It's a divide by 2 to the 16th. followed by a conversion to an integer and those are the main ones that you're going to use in this lab multiply float to fix fix to f oh fix to float fix to int and int to fix typically you would use float to fix only during setup only when you're getting the animation ready to go because you want to avoid floating point operations during the execution of the loop, of the animation loop. Also, <coughs> even though divide is defined, you want to avoid divi divide because that's rather, that's like 50 or 60 cycles. And interestingly, it's faster to do a floating point square root than it is a fixed point square root. Why do you think that might be? Well, it, it, there's, a, there's various technical reasons, but there's, the main one is that the number is already normalized to one half. It, the, the, do you know how fixed floating point works, actually? Do you know how IEEE, do you know what the format for IEEE fixed floating point is? Oh my gosh. It's a, it is a 24-bit, 24-bit, significant significant 8 bit exponent and 1 bit sign sign bit and you say wait a minute that's 33 bits how does it fit into a 32 bit word and the trick is in IEEE floating point, you always make the high order bit of the significant one, and therefore you don't store it. Oh. So, this is a fraction, this is a binary exponent, that's a sign bit. The way you take a square root, if you have the exponent is, you divide it by two, you shift it one to the right. 
So taking the si square root of the exponents, trivial, it's shift right one bit. Then the significant is always a number between 1 and 1.5. You can do a, a tri fairly trivial table lookup and get this to several significant digits. Then you do one turn of Newton iteration. Remember Newton iteration, zero finding? Finding, finding zeros of a function. You do one iteration, Newton iteration, you're done. However, <clears throat> if, you want to, if you want to have your, the numerical arithmetic side of your brain bent into knots, there is a fast floating point <coughs> square root that is almost impossible to understand that was invented by a graphics guy about 30 years ago. Look that up, it, it's really cute. And it uses the details of the bit pattern of the IEEE storage to take a fast square root. It's really, you say, ah, oh, this can't work, it's, ah, it's, it's like an and, uh, it's a shift in an and. Huh? Shift in and? But look it up sometime for your idle amusement. So for this, for this lab, you are going to avoid at all costs divides and square roots. And I suggest you work in 1616. I played with a bunch of different dynamic ranges, 2.30, 1616, 2.14. And they all have different uses, but for the purposes of animation on a liquid crystal display, 1616 is a pretty good compromise. So how would you use this? Well, let's go back over to the dev board page where there's an animation example you may want to look at. And once again, there are there's a bunch of fixed point macros and the usual timer thread and an animation thread. But in this case, the animation thread is going to is going to set up a bouncing ball. Did I show you the bouncing ball animation last time? I can't remember if I did or not. <coughs> I did, okay. So what we're gonna do in this thread is define a static fix 16, which is gonna be the X value of the, of the ball. And we're gonna define it as into fix 16, 10. And we're going to call G gravitational constant. We're going to scale it to 0.1. Why 0.1? Eh, it was about the right speed. So we're going to do a float to fix 16 of 0.1. And, a dra and the drag will be some uh, coefficient of atmospheric drag, which we're going to set to uh, float to fix 16, of, fix 16 of 0.01 also. So these are all initializations. We can use float operations here. We can't use them in the animation loop. So now all of our, and all of the numbers, for sanity's sake, what you're going to want to do in lab three is you're going to want to keep all of your calculations at all times in fixed format and only convert back to integer when you actually erase or draw the ball on the TFT because the coordinates for the TFT have to be in integer format. But until you actually modify the TFT, keep it in fixed format. <coughs> so what we're going to do is to, is to <coughs> erase a disk. That meant I didn't have to figure out where it was before. I, I'm updating the velocities and the positions. We're going to update the velocity as the current velocity, as the current velocity plus g times multifix, multifix velocity times drag. What the heck does that mean? Well, let's go back and, 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 and parse this down a little bit. Let's go. 
we're going to we're going to define some ax as my uh, in the drag direction in the in the y oh, the x direction so x y so this is x direction ax the acceleration in the x direction is given by the velocity in the x direction times some drag coefficient that's going to be a velocity dependent force which acts like air drag and there's going to be an ay an acceleration in the y direction which is g and remember y is positive down gravity is pointing in this direction so this is going to be a positive acceleration in y minus vy times d drag coefficient then we're going to Euler integrate this we're going to say that vx is equal to the old vx at, a t at another time step, at a previous time step, step plus ax times dt where does that come from? oh well it's a first order approximation to the differential equation which is that dv dt is equal to a so we have the v at t1 plus delta t minus the velocity at t over delta t is equal to a and if we just rearrange that we get this vy then is equal to vy plus ay dt and doing another Euler integration x is equal to x plus vx times dt and y is equal to the old y plus vy times dt okay so what we're going to do is to scale dt or, or put it differently our time step is going to be let me push the stack back one more step and say our time our, our time units for this simulation are going to be frames not seconds not milliseconds frames and therefore the step from one frame to the next is one so dt in all cases is going to go to unity because the time step is one frame the distance unit is going to be want to guess pixel, pixel. <laughs> right not centimeters not light years pixels so velocity now is going to be in units of pixels per frame this suggests another reason why we need to use fixed point if we had if we didn't have fixed point arithmetic if the lowest velocity we could represent that was non-zero was one pixel per frame at 15 pixels per second that ball is going to be zipping across the screen so we need to be able to go fractional pixels per frame so the velocity is going to be between zero and say a hundred pixels per frame but it could be less than one because we're going to represent numbers down to 10 to the minus 5 now what a, 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 a velocity of 10 to the minus 5 would would say that every 10 to the fifth seconds that's um, a day three days the ball would move one pixel bink that's a little slow for animation but it gives you enough dynamic range that you can that you can make good-looking animation 
So the first optimization is get rid of dt because it's always 1. Now when we go back and look at these equations, we can see that vy is equal to vy plus g minus the drag multiplied by vy and v, vx is equal to vx minus the acceleration in the x direction which is just the drag and dt is gone and then we update x and y as Euler integration and we find that we're just going to take the velocity and add it to the current position now <clears throat> I wanted to keep the ball from going off screen so I needed to compare the ball to some some edges of the screen and excuse me conservation of energy suggests that if I if I drop the ball onto the screen if I fire a ball onto here horizontally and it starts to drop conservation of energy says it should never go off the top of the screen so I didn't bother to check for that yes I, w I will after I finish this if you want yeah so we need to check the X boundaries so if X is less than 5 or X is greater than 235 we're going to negate the X velocity that's a mirror collision right that's that's the mirror bounce condition and if y is greater than, than interfix 315 negate the y that is to say when it hits the bottom of the screen have it bounce when it hits this side have it bounce and when we do that we get something like this turned sideways of course because that's the way I was holding the the camera and you can see that it, it bounces and finally stops because of, of viscous drag that's the this is the D term here so it does a reasonable job of 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 simulating the ball dynamics and the reason I, I chose limits of 5 and where was it <coughs> the reason I chose limits of of 5 and 315 was that I was using a ball of diameter 5 and I didn't want the edge to go off screen I gave it a little extra uh, wiggle room in your code you may not want to have a big chunky good looking ball because every pixel you write costs time and so smaller diameter balls or at least smaller images of the balls are going to mean that the code runs faster and efficiency counts so <coughs> this code uses most uh, I think all of the functions that you're going to need in your code it, it exercises int to fix, float to fix for setting up a calculation. It does fixed point arithmetic and it does comparisons between fixed numbers and fixed constants.
which is what you're going to need to do. So you had a question about the collision code? Yeah, the so is each collision um, treated like by itself? Like you calculate it? Because one thing I had a question about is like, what if you're, you had a counter where it was like le about to leave the collision? But what if while it's leaving that collision, it collides with another ball? So you're talking about, uh, so there's, there's a, there is a collision parameter that says that if two balls hit, after they hit, and they're going in opposite directions, don't let them collide for a certain number of cycles. So, that it, like, stops. so it's, it, it, it stops weird uh, uh, nonsense, uh, limited resolu uh, numerical resolution states. What if there was another ball coming in here that made a three-body collision, for instance? Yeah, like the rest is about to leave that collision, it goes into another one. Yeah, so it, it goes bam, bam, and then just as it's leaving, it hits this one, what should happen? In fact, what will happen is it won't collide. Like it'll just phase through? It'll just slide through. Is that okay? I said last time it's okay. I'll say it again. Yes. You can, this is a numerical fake so that this is possible to do in three weeks. And one of the fakes is that a ball after it collides cannot collide again for n cycles. If there's a nearby ball that it would collide with, it merely passes through. The reason this looks acceptable, remember in computer graphics, if it looks right, it's right. Uh, <coughs> There's some people on campus that wouldn't like that statement very much. <laughs> the, uh, uh, <coughs> but since three-body collisions are relatively rare in any dilute system, you're not going to see very many of these and you will ignore the ones that do happen. Also, there's this, interesting, there's this interesting psychological effect, which you, I don't know if you know or not, and that is that your visual resolution drops as the angular velocity of the objects increases in front of you. So your vi visual resolution for a stationary image at your age is probably between 0.1 and 1 milliradian. You can resolve something like a thousand points at, at a dist on an 18 inch screen 18 inches from your face. Maybe a little more depending on on the details of your retina, but about a milliradian. If you have a, an object going at a radian per second across the screen, so it passes an 18 across an 18 inch screen in one second 18 inches from your face, then your resolution goes down to about a hundred uh, about about 0.1 radian. You can't see stuff smaller than that. You think you can, but you can't. And so the faster something goes, the less visual resolution you have, and so small ambiguities or small areas you just don't see. Does any of you, has any of you actually ever actually seen a laser disc? It was a primitive recording device. It was about 15 inches in diameter and it held one movie. And it was an awesome increase in complexity and, and content and quality. It was a laser, <coughs> laser readout device. One of the first movies to come out on it was Star Wars. And people would stop frame through the laser disc looking for special effects errors because why not? I saw a wire! Oh my god, you see that wire? That's holding up a model. Well, come on, get a life. <laughs> but, but, <clears throat> but one of the special effects that was put in there was one of the spaceships that disappears at high speed to infinity is actually a tennis shoe. <laughs> Nobody ever noticed because you can't see it, it's moving too fast. So, so, and so now all of you are going to stop frame through Star Wars 1. Yeah. So, 
small changes like that, small, small errors, collision errors, you're just not going to notice. But you're quite right, it's, an error. It's, it's, a, it's broken as designed. The way this code is, this collision scheme was meant to be executed, this collision scheme, was to up uh, is to run the system forward in time until the next collision occurs which is the only time there's any force on any object is when the next collision occurs then update all of the forces and then calculate when the next collision is going to occur and update until that collision occurs and that is exact there's no round off errors and it takes care of multiple hits and it's too hard to implement uh, in this environment in an animation scheme because you always on every frame you have to have a new result to show you can't just wait till the next collision occurs and then show something else So you're going to be firing So you're going to be firing balls out of this out of one end of the of the uh, play area uh, with a random distribution of, of Y direction vectors they're going to be bouncing off of each other they're going to be bouncing off of the barriers and in the version that you're going to be doing this side of the barrier is the collector that you're aiming for you have to get you have to deflect balls onto this side they're going to bounce off of this side and be absorbed by this side of the barrier yikes Yes. Um, how many balls has somebody animated? Oh, on this architecture, I don't know, 200, 250. It's gotten so crowded on the playing field that it looks more like a, a liquid than a gas. But, but, uh, uh, but the minimum would be 30 balls, which I don't think is too much of a strain. But there'll be a small number of points, order of five points or so, that will be distributed depending on the number of balls. Last year we had to make it logarithmic because the dynamic range was too big to make it linear. Questions again. Cool. Lingering lab two questions. Um, so when you talked about <coughs> fixed 16 multiplication, um, how is 64 bit multiplication actually implemented on this architecture? I don't think it's in hardware. Yeah, that's a good question. It turns out that <coughs> 60, uh, 32 bit multiplication is implemented on the hardware. And so 64 is. 4 multiplies 3 adds. Each multiply is 2 cycles. The, the adds are uh, 1 or 2 cycles each. So the total time is going to be, I think I actually put this in a table, yes. Multiply cycles for fixed 16 is 12. And if you, if you go and look at the assembly language, it's 10 opcodes. How do you look at the assembly language? There's a, there's a, there's a windows or view, windows I think, uh, 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 menu, you pull that down and there's an option on there for, for looking at the assembly code and the, oh by the way the float's 50 to 53 and because I could never remember that, I documented in this page called PLIB, GCC, and other assembler junk. So there's a bunch of stuff about PLIB, 
there's macros, macros, blah, 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 blah. Whereas, oh, types. How are data types handled in this int, in this, in this uh, implementation? Integer promotion. Interrupt mechanism and syntax. Yes, project. Window debugging output disassembly. We'll get you the assembly listing so that you can peruse the code actually produced by the compiler. For those of you who are interested. I was quite interested for the multiply because I wanted to see how it did it and how good it was. It's good. So, Twelve cycles for a fix. That includes storing the result, too, by the way. Fifty to fifty-three for a float multiply. Ma multiply and accumulate is twenty for a fix sixteen and uh, around a hundred for for float. So for doing digital signal processing, you get about five times the throughput. Any questions on la on homework three? Not yet. Okay, out of here. <laughs>